and welcome to Crafting a Revolution, the podcast. My name is Katie Freeman, and I'm one of your hosts. Every Wednesday and Friday, we bring you interviews with female and non-binary makers of all kinds from all over the world. Today's guest is Beth Walker from the UK. Beth is a bench joiner, is the term that she used, uh, and for those of you who may be like me and didn't know what that meant, that means that she... Um, crafts, handcrafts windows and like stairs and stuff like that for a living full time. So, uh, but she is also a, an artist and educator um, and just super passionate about um, empowering those who may not traditionally be empowered with uh, teaching tools and all kinds of fun stuff. So I really enjoyed chatting with Beth and getting to learn more about her journey into what she does now and all of her creative past. Before we hop into the interview with Beth, though, I want to give a big shout out and thanks to the patrons over on Patreon. So thank you so much, Lee at Lee Runyon, Annette 513 Woodworks, Katie Thompson, Women of Woodworking, Kevin Lefty's Woodshop, Christy Twisted Twine, Jeremy Jeremy Spies, Sammy, go Sammy Lee, Rachel, Moody Makes, Bonnie, Tool Mom, Bonnie, Tool Mom, Store.com, uh, Laura, Oakley Soap Company, Brandy, Studio, Obey, Lee, The Rainbow Carver, Ellen, Little Bear Furniture, and Ethan, Ethan Carter Designs. Thank you also very much for your continued support, helping to produce two episodes a week, every week. With no further ado, let's hop on into the interview with Beth. All right. Well, I like to start by asking my guests to introduce themselves. So would you do that for me? Yeah, sure. So my name is Beth Walker or on Instagram, I'm Joinery Journal and my pronouns are she, her. And um, I am, what am I? I'm an artist. I'm an educator. I am a project manager. And also now I work full time as a bench joiner. So I make traditional wooden windows for a living. Okay. Yeah, thank you for <laughs> defining what a bench joiner is, because I was going to be like, I don't know. <laughs> do, you, do you use that term in the States or bench joiner? I so someone that would make like stairs, doors, windows? You know what? I don't know, because I'm not yeah. in that trade. So yeah, very likely we could. I just don't know. Um, so <laughs> appreciate you uh, explaining that. Um Okay, so we're gonna take a step back and say, what's your what's your big story from from baby Beth to yeah. you know to where you're at now? Y yeah, I've been thinking about this and thinking like how to summarize because it's not like a straightforward <laughs> journey that I've taken. But so I'll try and like okay. make sure it makes sense. So so yeah, I was born and raised in a small town called Folkestone, and it's in the southeast of England, and we're right on the coast. We're actually closer to France than we are to London. So like on a clear yeah. day, you can see France across the water. Um, yeah, and I grew up in a household with my parents and my older brother and my grandmother. And I went to school locally. And actually I was really academic. Like I, I've actually always loved studying. Like I'm, I'm a bit of a geek. So, <laughs> um, so I w was getting like good grades at school and like across different subjects. But actually I... I knew I was absolutely adamant that I wanted to go to art school. So, um, yeah, I've been, I'm really fortunate that my family have always really supported me and the decisions I've made. So, so I left school at 16 and I went and studied art. And, um, and it was during those two years where I found oil paintings. So actually I was making oil paintings. And then um, I was accepted for a place at Chelsea College of Art and Design. It's basically like a very prestigious art school in London. So I moved to London when I was 18 and I studied oil painting um, and made objects anyway. And, uh, <laughs> and then, um, yeah, did that like classic thing of like, you graduate and you're like, what am I doing now? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it was around that time that I started working in arts education. So I worked as an art technician in a secondary school um, in Hackney Central and uh, yeah, I was there for a while. And then and then everything kind of gets a bit mixed up. So anyway, so I left London with my ex-partner and we bought a van. We left London to convert it, basically, because mm -hmm. we wanted to live in Spain and Portugal for a year. So 
so we left London. We did it. We like absolutely gutted this van and like converted it. And then we went and spent a year in Spain and Portugal living in it. And then when I got back to the UK, we came back to, to, to Kent, to the southeast. And then I was invited to help set up and run an art school, which I did for four academic years. Um, but yeah, and then towards the end of that, so basically I left that relationship, but it was like a seven year relationship. And it like just so happened that my absolute best friend, only a few months later, she broke up from a 10 year relationship. <laughs> So it was like perfect timing. <laughs> so we did what any like sensible person would do. We basically both quit our jobs and she bought a van and we went traveling together in Europe for a year. <laughs> we, we ran away. Every sensible person does it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like forgetting your thirties and you're like, yeah. well, what am I doing with my life? I'm just going to go and live in a van. So we did that and it was great. And actually it's really, it's been really formative and it's a lot of the reason why I'm doing this now um so yeah that's kind of in a in a weird nutshell so yeah I've been back in the UK for somewhere between like a year and a half to two years that kind of time okay um yeah and since coming back that's then when I've actually now pursued like a professional career in in joinery mm-hmm. um okay yeah so <laughs> Like, I have so many questions. I'm trying to figure yeah. out where to start with. Um, it's not the most straightforward. Well, partially, like, talking about, like, the whole, like, van life. That's, like, mm-hmm. one of my, that's, like, my bucket. I think I'm going to put that on my bucket list. Like, I so want to convert, maybe not a van, but, like, a very small RV. Um, I want to, like, gut it and make it our own and, um, especially with COVID over the last, mm. like, you know, almost two years now, <laughs> um, it's been like, come on, let's just like do this and like hop in it. And I mean, cause school can happen anywhere for the kids and, um, I haven't quite talked my wife into it yet, but that's <laughs> I'm a champion. Yes. You to do. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> yeah. But that's, I mean, that's really one of those things is like, the idea of just getting to travel and learn from like just anywhere you land. I think a a lot of it has to do with this podcast too, of like learning the joy of learning other people's stories from like, Mm -hmm. you know, all over the place. And what better way to do that than like immerse yourself into someplace completely new. Um, So you did it twice, basically. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm actually now funny enough I'm in the process of doing my truck license so now I want like a bigger van I want to yeah. yeah yeah like a, <laughs> a half seven ton of thing but yeah <laughs> yeah so I mean when you can when you did that when you like gutted and convert, had you ever done any like work like that before had you ever done anything with kind of I guess construction is what I would probably yeah that as so like knowing that I was going to do this today, then you start kind of thinking like, right, how, like, what, what was the timeline? Like, how did these things happen? So yes, I had, yeah. And I think, so I actually, my first like paid carpentry job was when I was 19, but I didn't realise it was going to be carpentry work. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was very bizarre. So, so yeah, I'd, I'd done my first year of studying in London and, um, uh, and my old art school asked me to come back and work for the summer as an art technician mm-hmm. and I don't think I realized what that job would be but I just was like yeah sounds great but what it actually ended up being was like me and this other guy for three months in the summer we literally like were ripping down stud walls and rebuilding them <laughs> because at the end of the year the art school would like get rid of all the studios and make an exhibition space across oh. this whole building so what we were doing is like basically ripping down the exhibition space and rebuilding the studios but and I think like I had done some woodwork like I was always building my own stretches for my canvases Mm -hmm. and stuff but like I definitely wasn't proficient so that was like the first kind of proper yeah carpentry work and I just yeah I remember it being like really empowering like Mm -hmm. really being able to like build and destroy walls was wicked like (laughs) so that like did something for me which Mm -hmm. is still there and then yeah since then I've actually been building a lot and but usually because of my lifestyle so like 
when I left uni, so there were two guys that I studied with at the art school and um, we got an empty warehouse in like Hackney Wick. It's like in the east of London and it's like the old industrial mm -hmm. art quarter, I suppose. Um, so yeah, we when we moved in, it was totally empty. Um, and then we built like, so we built a room each and there was a there was another girl doing it as well so four of us so we were building like load bearing like structural walls we had a mezzanine we made another mezzanine out of scaffolding tube we were all artists so we like built our own studios you know and like yeah so I learned loads doing that and then after then I was squatting for a bit so then like building spaces and I did some plumbing and like mm -hmm. whatever and then yeah the van and <laughs> And then I also have like a real passion for like alternative building methods as well. So I really love cob, like mm -hmm. clay sand floor. Yeah. And so I've done some like construction work with cob. And then when we're traveling on friends' lands, we will build it, you know? So yeah. it's always been there. Um, it's only, yeah, now that I'm kind of doing that professionally. Mm -hmm. But yeah, very like a DIY <laughs> ethic, you know, like. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like all basically self-taught, like, or like learning through experience, like you're going to do this. And so you just go and do it. Um, yeah. But also I would say, oh yeah, I've been thinking about that. And there have been like just some really key people that have been really supportive. Like, like when, so the guys I was living with in that warehouse and at that time, actually, so an ex-boyfriend from then, who's still one of my closest friends, Liam, but so he was a civil engineer mm. but he really like supported me and encouraged me to build and actually when I left uni and I was like what am I going to do <laughs> I had this kind of um I had this dream that I was going to make a business and like make canvases for artists like make mm -hmm. stretches so I think it was like my 20th birthday like he bought me a table sort of like that was my gift you know so yeah. <laughs> and there's been quite there's been other key people like throughout this whole journey that you know guys always guys but like have really like supported me and encouraged me to build and like talk you know mm -hmm. just because I'm interested you know so yeah I mean yeah so do you have I guess I mean you talked about there was another woman in the warehouse space but has there been any like female friends who have kind of joined along and in, in doing some of these builds yeah like so in the like squat community um and that world that bit of me and my life like it's really normal that the the like women or someone who would identify as you yeah. know would also build as well like and when when I learned to do plumbing so we like push fit plums like our whole bathroom at the squat and that was like a female plumber that I was working with and so yeah I think yeah that feels quite normal it's only actually been in the professional workplace like where I am now so all of the guys that I work with I work there's one kind of head joiner and I'm underneath him and then there's like a whole crew that do like restoration of the windows and none of them have worked with a woman before like they've found it not odd but like like the first two weeks I was working there I think it's all that we spoke about <laughs> we were like so curious <laughs> Uh -huh. but actually after like a couple of weeks it's just very normal now but right yeah yeah I mean that's I think what you're describing to me is like what I found through the podcast is like that DIY makerspace tends to be like like the people who are actually making are very like open and sharing about like how to do things and it's not like your gender is not an issue, right? It's just, mm. like, oh, you're interested in doing this thing. Okay, let's go do this thing. But like professionally, especially in like the trade space, like that's not usually the case. Like there tends to be more, it's more male dominant and it can be kind of like toxic masculinity, mm. like male dominated in that space. Um, like I know I've, you know, had people on the podcast who are like doing home renovations and they'll say like on social media, the negative comments they get are from like 
professional men in the trade. That's right. like who's trying to tell them like stay in your lane, like this isn't something you should be doing type stuff. Um, but it sounds like you've had a decent like experience going into the professional, even though the first two weeks was talking about like <laughs> <laughs> you being female, like um, it still sounds like you know you didn't get too hard of a time. Yeah, I've actually like I know that that stuff does exist and I am I, actually on Instagram. I'm in touch with quite a lot of like different trade women or trade people. Mm -hmm. um, and I have read and like know a lot of those their stories and stuff. But but yeah, for me personally, it's it's been great. It's like the guys that I'm working with are really supportive. It, it, it just doesn't feel like a thing, you know, like mm -hmm. um People, people are actually really shocked and surprised when I tell them that I'm bench joiner and I make windows. They're like, you could see, you can see it in yeah. their face. <laughs> but, but then, yeah. Um, but they're not the people that I'm working with, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It, the only thing that I did find, like, it's something that I think I've just kind of got over myself, but like, so recently we've been working on a, we've been working in the National Portrait Gallery. It's like one of the main museums in the middle of London, like restoring and making new windows for them. And, um, and it's a proper building site. It's a huge, huge building site. And like, I found it quite difficult being there actually for the first couple of days. And um, yeah, I spoke about it with like a couple of guys that I work with when we were like traveling to and from the site. And, and yeah, and I think actually it was like, I had kind of built up a thing in my head of like I was worrying about like people like scrutinizing what I was doing or like yeah. not being capable of doing something in front of other people and actually like stepping back from that and talking it through with the guys that I work with it really changed my mindset and I actually went back into that space the next day feeling like yeah really empowered and really like so yeah it's hard to know yeah mm -hmm. Hey, Pond Squad. I would like to give a big shout out and thanks to this week's sponsor, Rockport Works. They offer safety footwear that suits people's occupation and lifestyle by incorporating performance, safety, and style into every shoe and boot. Each shoe features a slip resistant outsole and a toe cap varying between steel, alloy, and composite. Other features such as electrical hazard and shock protection are also available depending on your safety needs. So Rockport delivers extraordinary technology-based comfort using the latest advances in construction and design to create both modern and classic shoe styles. So whatever the outfit, they've got you covered. Their goal is to support your style, to take you from work to leisure and everything in between. Try Rockport. Rockport works for yourself and change the world without changing your shoes. Now, they offered to send me some boots and I said, hey, look here, I got lots of boots. I got plenty of boots. I really, really, really need a shoe that's going to work for me out in the workshop because right now, if I don't feel like wearing my work boots, I'm wearing my tennis shoes. And not only is it hard on the tennis shoes, those aren't really the best to wear protection and safety wise out in the shop. So they sent me a pair of their True Stride uh, work shoes, which are these slip on shoes that have a zipper on them and they consist of moisture wicking micro mesh liner and a leather upper. And they've got this nice little cushion in the heel that really is helpful for my lower back personally. Um, they have these shoes available in sizes from 6 to 12 in both M and W widths. I went with W because I've got a white foot. And I'm just going to let you know. So I went ahead and ordered my standard like eight wides and they do run a little bit big on me. But I love them even more for that, honestly, because that makes them easier to slip on and off. So I just slip right in, head on out to the garage, do some work, come in, take them off. Don't track sawdust all over the house. So it is fantastic um the shoe besides being super cool and comfy also meets all astm safety standards and requirements all right so if you want to try out a pair of the true style true stride shoes or any of their other work boots and shoes um, head on over to rockport works and you can use 
discount code FREEMAN25. That's FREEMAN, F-R-E-E-M-A-N, 25 to get 25% off of your purchase at checkout. So take advantage of this super sweet deal for listeners of the pod and head on over and check out Rockport Works. All right, let's head back into the episode. Sometimes we, sometimes for us, it can feel like a big deal and maybe it's not, maybe it's, maybe it's not as big a deal as Mm -hmm. thinking it was, I don't know. (laughs) Well, I think though, what you're hitting on is just like, I mean, the, the, the truth of it is, is being an other walking into like a predominantly whatever space, you know, in this case, you being female and walking into a predominantly male space, like whether it's real or not, like whether that you're actually getting that tension back, the fear is real because um, traditionally that's not going to be a safe space. Like whether it's about work or not work, like being the only woman walking into that space you don't know from the outset, like, is that a safe space for me to go into? Mm. I think, so I think that there's something in just like honoring that. I think the fear is very legit to have to go into it. You know, Um, I mean, I know I still get it. It's, you know, and I like in my professional career, I spend a lot of time generally being the only female in the space. And mm. even though I've gained confidence and I'm like, I know what I'm talking about, you know, and I know that I can portray that out to people. It's not even so much about like getting the professional respect, though there is some level of that, but it's just knowing like, okay, I'm walking into a space where no one in that room has an idea of like, the experience of me going into that space (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah you know and so like there's still that level underlying level of fear um and understanding um and you know I add another layer of I'm generally also the only queer person walking into that space and so like you know I have to go in going okay how much am I going to let be known about myself in order to protect myself (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. so but yeah it's really helpful like talking about this and and yeah yeah thank you yeah I think it's (laughs) it's, because actually it's hard you know when when I I just work with guys so right they're never gonna get it like no (laughs) and that's fine it is what it is but but yeah um yeah I also think though you know it's maybe it's not the reason why Mm -hmm. I'm doing what I'm doing but it's something that I like about the role of being a bench joiner is like I predominantly work in a workshop um Mm -hmm. and in a set location with the same people or like so there's kind of control in a way Mm -hmm. like walking onto a site is like I don't know what what's gonna happen it's like you know I can't control any of that stuff so so yeah that's partly like I find it yeah a lot more comforting I suppose like knowing that I'm going to be in a workshop most of the time yeah Um. yeah I mean exactly that's I guess that's kind of what I was trying to hit at is like it's that unknown and unfortunately still in the you know in the year 2021 like we still have to be aware of our surroundings um Mm. you know I don't know the UK statistics but I I know that there are still women and and non-binary folks who have been killed you know going to a work site and a male deciding like that they don't belong there and so that's like a legit you know I I just want to, I guess, say, like, don't downplay that thought, because I think you do still have to listen to your gut, like, just out of the sake of your own safety, (laughs) walking into those places, like, you still, it's okay that you were a little bit fearful of that space. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm glad that you were able to talk about it with your, your coworkers, you know, and, like, they kind of maybe bolstered some of the, like, 
you know your shit. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Type of attitude type thing. Um, and, and to me, then that also says like they probably would have your back in that space if something were to come yeah. up, right? And, and I really feel like they do. It's, yeah. you know, I've only been at this firm now for three months, but mm-hmm. I, I'm so fortunate to have found this company and like the people that I work with are incredible and I'm learning so much being there and you know we were actually talking it was during this conversation I was saying to Alex and he was like you know things don't change unless you change or like and and he was so right and like but I also find it so there's that kind of negative element to it but there's also that it's really empowering isn't it it feels Mm -hmm. so good to like be the only woman sometimes mm-hmm. and to be like yeah handy <laughs> like, yes yes <laughs> put stuff around like I can't yeah. <laughs> I know what I'm doing right <laughs> I kind of I really like that the that, that, that I have these two distinct like parts of my identity which is like I'm a woman mm-hmm. and I'm a joiner like I really love those that mix so like and also like that yeah there's some real positives as well like I've definitely like this conversation right now is a great example like of getting like offers to do things like and people were interested I think because I'm a woman initially mm-hmm. and you know um and I was really lucky like I'm still not allowed to like talk specifically about like the name of it and all this right. kind of stuff but earlier on in the year I ended up like shooting a tv show um which will be aired but yeah I was like the second carpenter on screen carpenter and um I'm you know I know that they only initially asked me to do that because I'm a woman Mm -hmm. (laughs) um but it was amazing it was like what what a crazy it was such a crazy thing that I did you know like two and a half weeks just stopped my life and right (laughs) lived in a hotel and was just a carpenter on tv it was just mad Um, (laughs) so yeah I think there's also great parts about it you know like I wouldn't want to change it yeah no I get it I mean that's why it's like to me it's really hard to ever separate the two parts those two parts of like yes I am a woman woodworker like it's really hard for me to separate those and I under I think I understand what you're saying when you're saying like it's really empowering um you know I've had guests on and we get into the conversation of like I don't want sometimes it's like no I don't want to be the novelty of being a woman woodworker I want to just be able to go into a space and be a woodworker and be treated as a woodworker and not seen like for my gender and I also understand that however I think that I bring something different to a space because I am a woman woodworker. Like, yeah. Yeah. I think it's like, you know, I think it just, I bring a different viewpoint than somebody who may do the exact same thing I do, but is a different gender or, you know, a, a, a different nationality or whatever. It's like, we all bring something based on who we are as our personality to our work. And so, like, I wouldn't want to change that, even if it means, like, sometimes, you know, I want to punch an old white guy. It does, I just don't want to change that. <laughs> sometimes. Oh my God. <laughs> but have you found, have you found, like, yeah, being a woman that you are offered other things that you think that you probably wouldn't be otherwise? Like, do you get kind of, I don't know. Are people more interested in what you do because of it or? I don't like, honestly, no. I mean, I still get from like the broader public and and I think I'm, you know, I'm thinking like locally, I still get the like, if I say I'm a woodworker, like kind of like you said, that look that they get, but the like, oh my gosh, I can't believe like you can do that. Like, You know, it's usually still like if I say I make furniture, I still get the, oh, you like flip furniture, like you paint. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Nope, I like make it from wood from scratch, (laughs) you know, And, and that's not to downplay the people who do flip furniture. I have nothing against that. But it's like that's like if you are a woman 
at least in this area that I live and say that you will, you know, make furniture, that's what they think. Like mm. that you're doing the like shabby chic, you know, type flips. And it's like, no, that's not what I do. This is what I do. Um, yeah. And then the like, oh, I can't believe you know how to do that. And it's usually in a tone of like, it's kind of a derogatory tone, you know, it's not like a, an amazed tone. So it's kind of, I don't know. I, I do agree with some of the women who have said like, I just want to be a woodworker in that sense of like, I don't, sometimes it's, I don't want it to be a shock that I know like that I can do that because it's like, well, of course I could do that. Like I've also like grown to human beings and birthed them. <laughs> like that's a pretty miraculous thing too. Like, <laughs> you know, like why would you think I can't run a, a table saw if I can like, if I'm capable of like growing an entire human being in my body? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I just don't understand that. <laughs> definitely <laughs> you know so yeah. yeah I mean I'm I'm waiting for that opportunity I will say maybe to your point like I've had a couple um like casting agents reach out you know for show stuff um I haven't gone on any but like I do think like yes when they're searching social media that they probably reached out because like I'm a woman doing what I'm doing um now do I hate that that gives me like a no <laughs> like I'll take it <laughs> it gives me an opportunity um I would like to see more of though and I had this conversation with seven about the metal shop masters class like or metal shop masters show on Netflix um that they were a part of I would like to see it like I love that they're looking for more diversity to cast. I actually want to see that diversity win in these competition shows. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I still feel like the, di the diversity candidate on the show gets more scrutiny by the judges than, like, the cishet white male. I'm, I could be wrong, but that's what it like appears like through my lens of like, oh, you had all these diverse, you know, people, but yet the people who are in the season finale are cishet white male. Okay. Like, sure. Because <laughs> um, none of those other people were as talented. Of course not. Like, I don't know. It just, uh, it still is like, well, what if you had all diverse? Like, what if you didn't have a single cis het white male in your cast? What would that look like? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, which it, like, yeah, there are that world. I mean, I'm not, I'm not interested in like pursuing a career in like TV at all. Right, it's right. not what I want to be doing. <laughs> But like, yeah, I think in the UK actually, and recently there's there's quite a big, um, there seems to be quite a lot of programs at the moment of like makers and and also, uh, yeah, whether it's like upcycling or recycling right, right. or like mending things. Yeah. And like there is diversity in the people that are on those shows. Yeah. Not always and not always, you know, yeah. it's not always fully re representative, you know. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure like a lot of it is very like tick boxy. Yeah. Have you ever seen, there's an amazing, uh, it's one of my favorite public speeches, but there's a, there's an actor called Riz Ahmed. He's British. He was in, um, oh my God, he was in like Four Lions. And uh, oh. I, I don't know if you ever would have heard of him anyway, but he did like an incredible speech in the Houses of Parliament. And it was for like Channel 4, one of the main TV shows. And he did this speech about, it was for equality and diversity. But the whole point that he makes throughout it is like, it's not about that, it's about representation. Yeah. And he just puts his points like so eloquently and so like beautifully. Yeah, I really recommend it. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, to your point and to his point, and I'm sorry, I'm like peeking, I keep peeking over because my cat... We've had mice and my cat keeps playing with something and I'm really oh, no. not going to bring a mouse in because uh, you will hear me scream um, <laughs> if she brings a mouse in. Um, anyways, <laughs> um, 
the whole point is exactly that it's representation right mm. and it's i mean i'm glad that they're starting to work to bring more representation like into the more of the public eye um i mean i feel like that's why social media is so important too is like you can maybe easier find representation that like feels more authentic to you you know however you identify um yeah. it's just that like you know in, in i'm sorry but not sorry if i offend somebody with this but it's like the representation for all of these especially trade type work um has been for eons heterosexual white men yeah <laughs> Yes. And so I feel like I really want to push the pendulum so far in the other direction for a very long time <laughs> that, that like it can even start to like make up for that. Like even just like the stories that are that so many people are working hard to bring to light now of like all of the women of history, all of the people of color of history who essentially had their work stolen or weren't allowed to like be the face of that innovation or the face of that whatever because of the time period they lived in, right? Like that work wouldn't have garnered as much recognition if their name had been on it. Like, yeah. I just feel like, okay, fine, let's push it so far in the other direction that we can maybe make up for some of that. Um, because even if we do that, even if social media, uh, network TV, all that stuff, even if they do push the pendulum that far, I can still guarantee you a uh, heterosexual white male is not going to lack opportunity. Like, they're not going to be harmed by that. Mm -hmm. And so the only thing to me that would come from that is good. <laughs> is that like the young people who are coming up could see themselves like potentially yeah. doing those things yeah right? definitely that's that's like yeah half the, the battle isn't it like half, yeah. kind of knowing that or feeling that you can occupy that space and like do that thing is massive yeah. yeah yeah I mean even like yourself so you started out in the art world and then ended up in carpentry <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> um I mean, and I feel like the art world, maybe like what you were talking about, like the oil painting and stuff, I feel like there's a little bit more uh, representation in that space. Um, probably still needs loads more work, but <laughs> like, was it a shock at all going from that to like carpentry world, like art world to carpentry world? Um, I mean, I don't know. Like I basically, I'm kind of aware that for like, people that I know that aren't necessarily close friends you know but they know me they found it really weird and like shocking that I've gone from like running an art school to now working in joinery but for me it's really logical like um but yeah my life is very different my everyday life is completely different in and actually you know I, I really am loving what I'm doing right now but like I'm still not past that initial exhaustion bit <laughs> like <laughs> I think it's a whole I've been speaking about it with some friends actually I think it's like a combination of factors because it's like you know we do like long days you're on your feet all day which is not which I was used to with teaching anyway but anyway yeah you're in your field day. it's really physical work yep. plus like everything's kind of new and millimeter perfect it's like we you know if I make a window that's five mil too small it's no good it has to get right. chopped away so like to to have that level of precision and detail all the time plus like taking on so much new information mm -hmm. um it's just been really tiring yeah <laughs> but um, yeah. but you know I think I think that's kind of what's interesting about retraining and, and doing something different like later on in life I kind of got to a point with teaching where like it was really comfortable mm -hmm. um I mean it's always hard work like working in education is hard work yeah. but <laughs> but I could kind of like rock up to work and spend the whole day teaching and come back and still feel like really energized 
and and I, I'm sure if any of the guys that I work with now, I was to like stick them in a room with like a bunch of 16 to 18 year olds, they would be knackered. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Whereas yeah, it was yeah. Like, <clears throat> so I think yeah, that that kind of like yeah, doing something very different with your day at the, at this age. I'm like 34 now, so it's mm-hmm. you know I'm not really a spring chicken anymore. So oh, you're still a spring chicken. <laughs> <laughs> You've got probably at least another 60 years on your, uh, so you're, you're good. (laughs) Hey makers, today's episode is sponsored in part by toolmomstore.com. At toolmomstore.com, you can find any and all tool-based merchandise for all genders, all sizes. They've got mugs, they've got shirts all kinds of cool stuff. I have uh, one of the shirts myself that has the uh, hashtag woodwork her on it. And I also have a couple of the mugs that define what and who is a tool chick. So super excited with the merchandise that I have. I know that you will be satisfied as well. Um, And also great discount for those of you who listen to the podcast at checkout if you enter the code maker mom you will get a 20 percent discount off any of the merchandise that you buy so that's just toolmomstore.com all right let's head back into the action um do you think so yeah especially that teaching world like do you think you'll want to pivot what you're doing now into teaching I'd love to yeah Yeah. but not but not like full time I think I so I've got like a number of ambitions and like things that I want to you know do um uh but yeah I'm really passionate you know there's there's a bit of this story that I actually haven't said which like the the reason why I kind of decided to like then come back and and like retrain and then get into this profession so so, you know, I mentioned like me and my best friend, we quit our jobs and we went traveling in this van. And it was about halfway through the trip and we ended up in Athens in Greece. And it was like the first place, we'd basically been moving every day, you know, da, 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 da. and we got to Athens and we chose, we were like, we want to just stay for a bit. And we wanted to do projects with like refugee community. Mm-hmm. Um, and Phil's really into like, she's always growing her own food and she's really into cooking and preserving and baking so like she ended up doing projects um on like community kitchens Mm -hmm. and it was there that I found I basically ended up doing like three kind of woodwork projects out there so I helped to like build a kids adventure playground in a squat and then I um also went on this like totally mental solo mission of like I basically built all of these like planters to go in this community cafe space to grow food Mm -hmm. um and then because I was doing that then I found this like oh it's amazing right there's this project called scrap co-op and um it's like in the industrial bit of Athens and it's attached to a bigger building and that's called anchor and it's like a kind of free um education space for like Mm -hmm. refugees and migrant communities and there's people there that volunteer and they run like short courses in like literacy and numeracy but also like sewing and uh, so many things yeah anyway and scrap co-op um is basically like a warehouse space at the back of that and it's predominantly a woodworking a wood workshop but they have like metal and and electronics Mm -hmm. and stuff like that and um, so, yeah, I was there basically every day because I was building these planters. So then I started to get kind of involved in that. And like, oh, I'm really passionate about working with refugee communities and um, and young people and like mm-hmm. marginalised people. So. So, yeah, I, I would love to at some point kind of, yeah, be able to like combine my teaching and my like mm-hmm. political activism and like and my woodwork skills but I feel like yeah I don't know I feel like I need more time to like get really get to know my craft mm-hmm. you know but I'm ready to to do that but um, yeah yeah I uh <clears throat> that resonates a lot with me I mean I've had a, a dream for a for a long time of wanting to create a like very inclusive space, you know, specifically for like 
women, non-binary uh, people of color um, to be able to come and learn basically skills with power tools, you know, whether that would be to make uh, their own piece of furniture or do like a project on their home or whatever. Um, but also making that space like have free daycare and have like, you know, being able to like really open it up so they could come and learn a lot of skills that could, you know, help them what take their life forward. Like that's mm. really, I mean, I just, I don't know. I feel so strongly that like learning how to use a power tool is so empowering. Like, <laughs> um, because even I feel like every person I've ever had on the podcast, like once they learn that first tool, like that first power tool, it's like you feel like you can take on the world, right? It's like yeah. that, like I can go learn this other tool now. Like I'm not afraid to go do that and do that and do that. Um, and it just opens up so much and it frees you from being, from relying on somebody else to come in and do that work for you um, yeah. <clears throat> and so yeah I very much have um, I'm getting more and more into working with like the domestic violence shelter in my area and stuff like that and really strongly wanting to like start providing classes for those who like recently get into their own space um, after being at the shelter and like teaching them just even how to make furniture out of like two by fours so that they can furnish their space, you know, when they don't have uh, a lot of money available and all that kind of stuff. So awesome. Yeah. Yes. So good. <laughs> and you're totally right. Like power tools make you feel powerful. Like they just do, don't they? And yeah, I find that with like shop machine, you know, big shop machinery now. I feel like a God sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can set up a spindle molder. Like yes. that's right. <laughs> good <laughs> yes yeah exactly. so, yeah amazing yeah great and like that's a great community to work with who really need as much power as they can get back you know like yep yeah, yeah exactly that's... yeah so you know someday someday my my first goal is like I have to become like successful in my own business before I can like open things up because um, yeah you know finding funding and all of that stuff like you have a better place like people look at you better if you're actually successful <laughs> instead of like <laughs> I do this thing and I'm good at it I just don't make any money at it <laughs> <laughs> they don't look as great on you if you don't make any money at it unfortunately <laughs> I think it yeah and it's also about it's like satisfying yourself as well I think it's really important like teaching's a wonderful thing and I do love it but like it's easy to get lost in supporting everyone else's journey and not actually retaining some of that for yourself as well that um yeah it's exciting though yeah do you still get to do your own art like do you still do art pieces of your own um not really I mean when when we were traveling so I made like this multimedia project when when we were in the van um since coming back to the UK so anyway yeah I was making like observational digital drawings mm -hmm. um on my iPad and um and yeah recording sound and video I've made a couple of like little short films since I've been back but I haven't actually painted in like a long time um yeah I I had like a studio practice it's really hard to describe artwork isn't it but anyway mm -hmm. so kind of got all these different things um I do yeah I do still make drawings and actually recently I've been working for an arts festival so I've been doing some project management for them and also some um I've been taking tours of the it's like an outdoor sculpture festival mm -hmm. um and I've been doing drawing tours so like like each participant gets a bag and like um we go out they all have their own drawing equipment and we go and make drawings of the sculptures so so yeah I still kind of have like a few fingers in like those mm -hmm. sorts of worlds you know those pies but um but yeah I haven't had a dedicated 
art studio space in a while yeah so what do you think feeds your soul more the the art or like the building oh I don't know <laughs> all of it all of it, all of it like, yeah <laughs> I kind of find like I know about myself like I I need to be challenged all the time if I'm not being challenged then I switch off mm-hmm. so um I think I think it's a bit like food like different things nourish you at different times don't they and mm-hmm. and like so I'm really happy to be like learning this trade this skill this craft you know craft of being a bench joiner my I actually have some like different ambitions though for the future so like I I want to carry on doing windows for a while and I really like windows because they're really technical um there is definitely like a right and wrong with Mm -hmm. them which is unlike kind of artwork or design or whatever but but for me right now that's really good and it's a good place for me to like hone my technical knowledge and like expertise but actually what I really would like to be doing in the future is I want to design and make my own furniture Mm. and I'm really into do you know what marquetry and parquetry are yeah Yeah, okay so like so like I'm really into parquetry like interlocking geometric repeat Mm -hmm. pattern so my kind of vision but this is like a long way away Mm -hmm. but I'd really like to be designing and making my own pieces of furniture but with like bespoke parquetry surfaces Mm. so then it becomes a bit more of a blend of like an art practice and the craft woodwork skill oh yeah absolutely yep yeah that's kind of the vision so have you um started any practice in in either one of those yeah, yeah. In Dublin. not with the furniture but with um yeah some yeah. marquetry and parquetry stuff yeah um it's really crazy you know I I also so I also rent my own workshop in a completely different place and I built that it was before I ended up taking this job and I thought that I would be spending my whole summer in my own workshop and doing private work there and actually I got this job like instantly after after retraining and I've gone straight into that and like I'm 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 still renting my workshop but I'm just never there (laughs) so ridiculous so I've got to make some decisions like after Christmas I think of what I'm doing but like yeah I want to start making some time in the weekends to like get up there it's quite a drive from here so like yeah the weekends is when then I can focus on like the kind of marketry parquetry stuff and I've started to seek out like I want to do some kind of evening or maybe like distance learning courses on like furniture design, furniture history. I feel like I really need to learn that. Um, so, yeah, I need to like ch- be chipping away, basically. Yeah. I will give you a little warning with the furniture history. Not that I've taken it, but I know mm-hmm. enough that... Uh, I mean, what they usually teach is European furniture history and what they miss is the uh, other cultures. <laughs> Those designs were basically yeah. stolen from. <laughs> um, so just be forewarned that like there's a certain lens that a lot of those um, classes look through. Um, yeah, thank you. I will. Yeah. Do you know what? Oh, I, you know, I had some really good reflection time when like um, Black Lives Matter was really like picking up and, and you know, I actually, we did some, um, it was like a little private group of like people here, but we, we did some like anti-racism work together and we really, it was, it went on for weeks that we were kind of getting together and doing the stuff. And, and it was like a realization that I had, that I hadn't had before that like, so my knowledge of art history is quite good, you know, but I was like, oh, like, <laughs> most of the art history that I know is like white cis male yep and like yeah and and I know how I feel about the British Empire and I know how I feel about like taking things from other you know know how politically I feel about that and like and it just hadn't dawned on me that like all of my knowledge of art history was just like (laughs) through a completely white male lens it's like oh man (laughs) so yes thank you (laughs) 
I will <laughs> be a lot more cautious with the. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, and yeah, to be completely fair and honest, it's kind of similar with me with like furniture design. It's taken, you know, over 200 interviews through this podcast for me to have those that same realization of really like it's been a slow process right and like understanding just based off of people's experience um mm. like having the having Amanda you know a, a black woman luthier on and like from the get-go her talking about like she's like one of on, like the only one or one of two like black female luthiers in the industry and talking about on record and she's like and I'm specific about on record because of course there was plenty of like black slaves who were luthiers mm. who were not allowed to sell under their own name or mm. to produce under their own name you know just even having like well of course you're right like duh like you know that should have been a realization but until it's like right there it's like yeah you know yeah. um so yeah it's I, I was given good advice through a podcast interview which is like if you find design that you like like take the time to really dig and to try to really search like so that you can give the appropriate credit to like who inspired you right? Mm -hmm. Like, not just the, like, white man's name who's on it. Like, is there, and maybe there's not, maybe that is the right person to, like, give the credit to, but, like, do a little bit more digging. Like, where yeah. does, where do those shapes and lines and design, where does that come from? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, you could probably find a lot, even with the marquetry, like, where do some of those patterns, <laughs> those designs sure. come from, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's quite the kind of like aesthetic, the thing that yeah. I'm, the furniture that I save on, on my <laughs> folders on Instagram, that I'm like, oh my God, I love it. I mean, yeah, definitely like not a white male that's that. <laughs> like, yeah. But, uh, yeah. But I think, yeah, probably a big, big influence from like Islam and, you know, like, but anyway, it, the yes. world is vast. Yes. Yeah. yes. There'll be a lot there. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to see what you kind of come up with as you continue to go down that path. Um, I mean, I'm definitely passionate about furniture design. Don't come to me and ask how to make that profitable because I still have not figured that out. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I enjoy making it. Um, and right now that's what I take is the enjoyment from making it. Um, I would say like you can totally see that in your feed and like <laughs> before it was before I knew that you did these podcasts but I yeah. was like watching your feed anyway and like you can see how empowered you are doing it and how joyful it is in that process and like yeah yeah um, which is good I'm glad like because that's the other part of it right is like I want to if nothing else if I never you know really actually make money off of this as a business like I want people to like be empowered through seeing me do it like if I can figure this out truly if I can like face my fear and figure this out you can face whatever your fear is and figure it out mm. like you really can um and then I also recognize though like I'm also in a position to get to chase after the, some of those things that people that aren't always in a position for so that would be yeah. the other the other part right it's like I'm always looking for how can I give similar opportunities to others you know how can I help open the door how can I whatever that looks like um I mean in your space so in your shop you're the only woman Mm. I do want to ask like are there any people of color in your workspace no yeah and when you went to like the site were there any people of color yeah, yeah. Like, yes <laughs> but uh, you know there was a crew I wouldn't want to say actually where I wouldn't I don't know where they were from yeah but um yeah they were definitely like in the really like manual they were doing the really like manual work of yeah. like breaking up the plasterboard and taking it out to the skip, you know, 
there was also there's there's a yeah there's quite a few polish uh people mm. who are on that site and then the people that run it are irish this is quite a mixed bag but yeah mainly mainly white but mm. but not completely mm -hmm. um yeah but that, i think that's quite normal in london though i mean it's such a like eclectic mm -hmm. um like culture and communities that we have there to, yeah maybe it's a bad place i reckon if it was a site in in uh the southeast of england mm -hmm. it would it might look a bit different you know okay okay yeah but maybe still like eastern european communities mm -hmm. uh, yeah yeah do you get a lot of you said you're passionate about like refugees and stuff like that are you getting like re like is your area getting a lot of refugees from like the middle east um area yeah. 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 So like, um, yeah, we, there's quite a lot happening actually in and around this town. And so, yeah, we have um, we have a it's shocking. It's awful. It's an old like military barrack that's like the other side of the town. And it's being used as housing at the moment for um, for refugees. Um, it's like appalling conditions. So, yeah, we've been doing like demos like mm. here and also in Dover which is a big port town and then also I volunteer with Channel Rescue so we're like um like a self-organized collective of people and we we actually like what we go out on the cliffs and we watch for people making that journey because hundreds of people are coming across from France at the moment and have been for a while um so yeah it's very like prominent in the town there's like some amazing I've done some like mentoring with young refugees in the town before and there's like an amazing organization CRAN who the Kent Refugee Action Network they work with like young unaccompanied minors and where I was working at the college I also had contact with, with some of those young people so yeah it's very much like important here yeah. you know like yeah um yeah yeah well, I hope you get to get to that space where you can <clears throat> teach and, you know, empower, especially that group, right? I mean, just mm -hmm. like kind of the domestic violence, like I would, I feel like that refugee group could use like gaining some power back within their, their lives as Definitely. all in uh, turmoil when, once they make that journey. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. We are at the end of our time together. <laughs> I don't know if we talked about what you expected us to talk about at all, but <laughs> it's been lovely. It's been like a really nice, genuine conversation, you know, yeah, not just yeah. <laughs> go on somewhere and make a pitch about your life. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, I want to give you a chance to tell people where they can like find you and kind of follow along and see what you're up to. Yeah, so the only platform where you can follow me is on Instagram. So the uh, name of the page is Joinery Journal. Um, yeah, and then you'll get to see where I'm working and the stuff that I'm making and also the journey that I've kind of taken in woodwork to get to this point. Awesome. Is your van on there anywhere? Yeah, buried <laughs> towards the bottom. <laughs> there okay. <it> is. <laughs> I'll have imagine. to scroll farther. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and when I get the new one, that will be I'll be updating. But yes, awesome. It's be a big project. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for chatting with me today, Beth. Yeah, thank you, Katie. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah. All right. So again, that was Beth Walker, uh, also known as Joinery Journal, on Instagram. I will include the links on how you can follow along with her in the show notes for today's episode. Uh, the best places to find that is to look at the description in your podcast app. Or if you happen to be watching this on YouTube, check the description box down below. And lastly, you can head on over to freemanfurnishings.com forward slash podcast and find today's episode as well as all the previous episodes there. Make sure you follow along with the podcast over on Instagram at Crafting a Revolution. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe, like, and follow, especially on iTunes and Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, 
When I am not making podcast episodes, you can find me designing and making and power carving and dancing at freemanfurnishings.com and at Freeman Furnishings on most actually all of social media. I am active on a daily basis on Instagram at Freeman Furnishings and pretty close to daily over on TikTok at Freeman Furnishings there as well. So come on over and say hi. I hope for those of you who are in the U.S., you had a great holiday weekend last weekend, and I uh, hope you get have a good start to your week so far. And as always, let's go craft a revolution. Solution for the toxic masculine.